Okay, um, we may briefly cover some of the similar ground to what Bruchin will be talking about next week, but we can, uh, we need to cover some things as a kind of background. So, um, firstly, did anyone make any headway with this document? I've even provided you with Peter Bartram's notes at the back, not that they would make much sense at all, I don't suppose. But um, anyone have any ideas, any thoughts of one sort or another? I admit it's not the uh, easiest of text to read, but probably the most exciting that we've read this semester, you know if you're a sad person like me. This is a genealogical tract, a group of genealogies. Um, it survives in a manuscript in the British Library called the British Library manuscript Harley 3859. The date of that manuscript is quite late, but into this manuscript, and maybe on the continent, were added a number of texts that are connected to Wales. We have the Historia Britonum, which I mentioned a few weeks ago in connection with studying uh, history, Gildas, and so on. Bede, we mentioned the Historia Britonum. Another text that we've looked at already once, the Annales Cambriae, the Welsh Annals, and these genealogies. Which is the earliest surviving uh, set of Welsh genealogies. The language is Latin and though there aren't many Welsh words rather than just names, Old Welsh. It's a very old form of Welsh. Okay. As we said before, the word map means sun and I think once we get Merk, there's an H in modern Welsh, Merk, which is daughter. <coughs> You've got my scribblings and uh, underlinings and divisions, which may or may not seek to uh, help to explain some things. But uh, firstly, what am I suggesting by connecting the first two genealogies. What's going on there? It says number one, Gwynedd, number two, Dyved. That's added by the editor because that's the name of the kingdom. And number one is this kingdom in the north. And number two is this kingdom in the south. What am I suggesting by drawing attention? How? We're going backwards in time rather than forwards. So it's Owen Map Higwell means Owain, son of Hoel, son of, son of. So they're going backwards in time. So Owen is the most recent person and we're going backwards in time. So it's son of, son of, son of, son of. 
so have another go. Right, how? I mean, what's the basis? I mean, the, the names are added by... What's the relationship first? How are these two pedigrees, genealogies, connected? Now we've established... They don't know, they don't descend from him, because he would be the oldest. If you descend from someone, it means you, he's the oldest person. He's the most recent. So we're going backwards from him. We're ascending up rather than descending down the genealogy from him. Look at the names. We've got Owen first, Map Higwell, Map Kateth, okay, in the first one. In the second one, Owen, Map Ellen, Merk, Yomark, Map Hermate, Havith. So what have we got? We've got Owen and what comes after him? I've Look at these words. What do these words mean? Map means son of. Merk means daughter of. Owen, son of Howell, son of Kadeth, son of Rotary. Number two, Owen, son of Ellen, daughter of the Jochmark, Lowach. They were married, okay? Or at least they obviously had some kind of relationship which produced a son, okay? So Owen was the product of the union of these two people, okay, or whatever. So that's our first bit, okay? And he occurs in both of the genealogies at the start with his paternal genealogy and his maternal genealogy set out. And his genealogies come first. So what does that suggest? We've got him twice, we've got his mother and father's descent, and those are the two first genealogies in this collection. So that suggests maybe what? If, okay, the text as we have it has been messed around and there are mistakes and errors and things like that. It's not a perfect copy of the original thing. That's been lost, okay? But, uh, and even perhaps the order of parts of the material have been mixed up because they wrote in these columns. You can see the columns there and so on. But it's very clear that the first two genealogies, the first two parts of this collection of genealogies is these two. And they both begin with Owain, with Owen, okay? And they're the only two genealogies that begin with the same person. Other ones go back to common ancestors, but these are the only two that begin Owen, da 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 da, Owen, da 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 da. Okay, and they're at the start. So what does that maybe, we can't be certain, but what does that maybe suggest? Zaina? Okay, yeah, the political union and things like that. And yeah, okay, it's his, it's his genealogy, it's his collection, okay? He somehow is the political mind behind it. And as we said, in him, as Zainab said, we've got the union of these two kind of areas. We call it rather loosely, uh, Gwynedd and uh, Doved, okay? So... This is a collection of genealogies put together, brought together, maybe not by King Owen himself, but by monks working for him. Anthropologists have studied genealogies in Africa and other parts of the world, and we realize now that societies that like to preserve genealogies are not doing it just for historical reasons, to preserve information, like the Mormons do today elsewhere and so on, but uh, they usually have a number of purposes. We've mentioned this, I think, before, political purposes, and they change genealogies to change their political purposes. So we have to be very suspicious. We have to think, okay, here is something created by King Owen, 
or under his auspices, under his power, okay, and it probably has some kind of political purpose. It has a function for him as the king. It's effectively political propaganda. Politicians in all ages lie. Modern politicians lie. Early medieval politicians lied as well. They just did it in different ways. They did it with genealogies. The guys today do it with TV and things like that, okay? They fiddle around with statistics and all sorts of things like that. But basically, the same motivation is there. And I'm, I'm, being, I'm exaggerating, being silly. But they've got a purpose. They have an intention, which is to keep in power, primarily, to keep their power and to legitimize and explain themselves and so on. So we have to begin with the assumption that this guy, Owen, is trying to do something, at least partly, perhaps, or someone is doing it for him in this collection. Okay, did anyone else come up with any, anything? Do we notice any other connections? If we read through the first genealogy, let's see if we can find someone that we've come across before, if you can cast your minds back. Owen map Higwell, I'll read them in modern Welsh. Owen map Howell, map Cadell, map Rodri, map Mervin, map Esist, Merg, daughter again, Conan, map Rodri, map, map Igual, map Cadwaladar, map Cadwallon, map Cadvan, map Iago, map Belly, map Rune, Matt Mylkun. Mylkun. I've underlined that guy. Mylkun. Maglokunos. Maglokunos. Gildas. You remember Gildas? That priest in Wales complaining about the five kings that were living at his time, how they were failing to look after the British people. And that's why the Anglo-Saxons earlier had come in and now they were not changing their ways. They were immoral people and so on. Maglo Kunos was the worst of these. He was the one that gets the final attack, okay? Here is a king that we can connect possibly with Gwynedd mentioned in the genealogy, okay? So this is a, de a descendant. Owain is claiming to be descended from uh, Maelkun. We go further back. Cadwallan Lauhir, Lauhir, Aenion Girth, Cuneda, Cuneda. Okay, very important name. And I think I've mentioned Cuneda before. Double D in modern Welsh. Okay, let's go to the next page and the next page. Go to number 32. So here, right at the end of the tract. Haec sunt nomina filiorum cuneda, quorum numerus erat nurem. Okay. Yes, can we have a translation from our Latinists here? Anyone wish to have a go? Sons of... These are the names of the sons of Cuneda whose number was nine, okay, who were nine. Tibion, primogenitus, firstborn, qui mortuus in regione que vocatur manau gortot in, and I don't have a map here, let me see if I can get a bigger map, and we can remind ourselves of where that was. That's, we don't have the old maps, but... Godothin was one of the old Celtic kingdoms up in the north before the arrival of the English. Okay, it was up here. Okay. So the first son, the oldest son, Tubion, was or died in the region called Manau of Godothin, somewhere up here. Okay. Et non venit hook com patre suo et com fratribus suis predictis. Didn't come this way here with his father and his uh, brothers. 
Then we get more information. Merion Filius Aeus, his son, Tebion's son, uh, divisit pas, pes, possessiones inter fratres suas. He divided his lands between the brothers. Okay, the brothers, uh, uh, not his own brothers, but his father's brothers. Then we get the list of the other sons of Cuneda. Osmael, Hrumyaun, Dunot, Keretic, uh, Ebloig, Aenion Girt, Dokmail, Etion. Okay, Aenion Girt, Aenion Girth, occurs in the first genealogy. You'll see he is the son of Cuneda. So we made one little connection there. The story goes that Cuneda and his sons, the number varies, came from the north of England into Wales to expel the Irish. Okay, we have this mentioned in other sources as well. It's probably a legend. And then his sons create a series of kingdoms. Now, for example, a bit clearer now. Okay. We have number three son is called Rimaun, Rivaun. Okay. And this is his name in modern Wales, Rivon Yog, the kingdom of Rivon. Okay. We have Dunout, number four, Dunod, Dunodding, the kingdom of, of, of his people. Keretic, number five, Keredigion, this kingdom here. Okay. They don't always all work in this kind of way, and there's a few others, but they're not on this map. So this is suggesting that this guy called Cunetha, his sons were the creators of a series of kingdoms that kind of spread around this area in North Wales, okay, and um, mid-Wales. It may or may not be true, but it's a political way of connecting these ones, and they're part of this descent. So our friend Owain is claiming through his father to be connected to all these other kingdoms as well. Okay, let's look at the second genealogy now. See what we can make of this. The photocopy isn't great. Okay, this is through his mother, Ellen. We notice another female connection further up. Okay, turn over the... Oh, no, no, before we... No, I haven't finished on the first one. Very sorry. Keep go back to the first one. Okay, after Cuneda here, we go back through various, um, in some cases, rather interesting names. Itern. Patern and Tacit, these are all Latin. Iternus, Paternus, Tacitus, and so on. Okay, so these are Roman names. Then we get names that look a bit very silly, and that's why I put lines there. Cain and then Gurcain. Dolly and then Gurdolly. Duven and then Gurduven. Okay, these look as if they've been made up, okay, because they're kind of rhyming and things like that. And a few more names. And then finally, we get back to this guy called Amalech. Qui fuit belli magni filius et anna mater eos. Qui dicunt esse con sobrina Mariae virginis matris domini nostri Jesu Christi. Okay, something important going on here. We've had the name of Jesus Christ mentioned, so this must be important. Amalek, who was the son of Belli the Great and of Anna, Okay, grammar is a bit loose here. We prefer that to have that in the genitive, I suppose. Quam, who, that's her, uh, they say was or was to be, was a con sobrina, which might mean cousin or something, of the Virgin Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this genealogy is taking Owain back to Cuneda, this important founder of kingdoms, and then all the way back to some guy called Belly, who through his wife was connected to Jesus Christ. Okay. That's quite a big claim to be made in a genealogy. Uh, and we would laugh now, but people at the time would maybe or maybe not believe it, but they would actually get some kind of message. Okay. A Christian connection is a good thing. Okay, now we'll go back to the second one. This is the one connected to David, the southern kingdom. 
we go back quite a long way here. The name, one name I'd like to draw your attention to, well, there's an Arthur here, but we won't worry too much about that Arthur, because that's not King Arthur, as far as I know. But um, on the same line as Arthur, second line, Gwartepir, this is our old friend Vortipor, who was the guy on that Ogham inscription that I showed and is also mentioned by Gildas. Okay? And the Ogham inscription, we said, was Dan Doved somewhere. So it's a connection with that one. Okay? And then we have a few more of these kind of pseudo uh, Latin names, Ercol, which might be like Agricola or something, and Trifinus and things like that. And then we get the name, names Nimet and Dimet, which again look very artificial and made up, rhyming ones. Then it says Maxim Guletic. Now you won't know who this guy is from this. Maximus, you remember, again, we mentioned the late 4th century figure Magnus Maximus, who allegedly removed the British soldiers from uh, uh, Roman soldiers from Britain in his attempt to uh, conquer uh, the south, uh, to reclaim to claim the Roman throne and so on. Then we get names like Protec and Protector. Strange names. They even put uh, brackets around things. Then we get Constans, Map, Constantini Magni, Constantine the Great. Okay, wow, now things are really hotting up. We're getting all the way back to uh, the, the Baba of Istanbul here. Big claims being made in this one. Uh, et Helen, okay, and his wife, his uh, Quay de Britannia uh, exuit, um, ad crucem Christi uh, querendam, okay, he, they left Britain searching for the cross of Christ as far as uh, usque ad uh, Jerusalem, and then um, they bring it to Constantinople and it stays there until this day, okay. The claim of the true cross of Christ, piece of the true cross of Christ being taken to Constantinople by Constantine the Great, who is ancestor of our friend Owain, allegedly. Okay, great claims here. So on the one hand, he's going back to um, Jesus Christ through belly. On the other hand, he's going back to Constantine and so on. Okay, he's making some big claims to his ancestry. I won't go through the whole thing, but here is my schematization of this tract. Now, in fact, this doesn't take, there are 33 entries, and about 20 of them can be put together. Some of the others, in their current form, don't, can't be fitted in perfectly, okay? So, about a third, two-thirds of these can be slotted into this scheme, this plan. So this is what we've been looking at so far. Here's Owain, through his mother, back to Magnus Maximus, back um, to via uh, Constantine. I haven't put Constantine in. I'm sorry, that's my mistake. If you put uh, Constantine in, and then uh, further back in a separate diagram in number 16, okay, we get Constantine again, and then it goes all the way back through all sorts of people who were not related to each other and so on. It creates a genealogy out of different names to Octavian, okay, Augustus, the uh, after of the first real emperor, okay. So I would write in here, Rome. All this stuff is claiming to be connected to Rome, okay, there. On the other side, through his father, Okay, he claims to send back to this Kaneda, and then we can put not all, but many Welsh kingdoms are connected to him there. We've seen this one going back to Belly Mao, Belly Magnus. Okay, let's just put Christianity there. Okay. And the last figure to mention, who occurs in lots of them, and also is connected to uh, Beli Mao, Beli the Big, Greli the Great, is a guy who's called Coil, and sometimes given his nickname Hen, which means old. 
You may, I don't know whether in America, maybe Genghis might have heard. Have you ever heard of Old King Cole? Yeah. yeah. Old King, it's like a rhyme. How does the song go? Do you remember? Like, Children's I Rhyme. I heard it since I was a kid. Right. Old King Cole, I don't, I don't suppose it's popular in Turkey, is it? <laughs> old King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. Blah, 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 he called for his and things like that. It's a children's thing, and we, we learn it in England, obviously in the States as well, okay? And I was very surprised when I was a PhD student to recognize that Old King Cole was not only some guy in um, children's rhyme, but figured in medieval genealogies as well. There was someone there, okay? Uh, we usually spell it these days like that or something, but in modern Welsh, coil, like that, coil a hen, coil the old, okay? which hen, meaning old, also means ancestoring, often in genealogies. And the many lines here indicates that from the different genealogies in here, he's the ancestor of lots of guys, mainly connected to northern British kingdoms and lands. Okay. So the old British kingdoms that the Scots and the English destroyed Okay, with the exception of Strathclyde, which survives a bit longer. But all the kingdoms up here, lots of them claiming to be connected to this guy called Coyle Han. He's their, he's their ancestor. So putting it all together, these two-thirds of the dire of the genealogies at least, I would suggest that Owain or his uh, advisors the monks who were working for him, had something like this in mind. Now, the text's been messed up, things have been lost, things have been moved around, parts not copied, so we're not clear. We don't have a perfect representation of the original scheme that they drew up, but something like this seems to have been the plan. And there may have been other connections that we can't make anymore because of mistakes by the copyists and things like that. So... Uh, oh, yeah, and finally, I, I've just noticed there's another thing. If we look at number 16 here, the big long one that leads back to uh, Octavian and so on, Rin, Map, Nathan, blah, 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 blah. On the third line, you'll see we've got Karataug, Map, Kinbelin, Map, Tehant. And I have written there in my very small handwriting, uh, Caraticus, Cunobelinus, and Tasciovanus, who were kind of pre-Roman rulers and leaders in Britain. We know about these people with those names, fighting against the Romans or collaborating with the Romans and things like that, or before the Romans came, making coins. So those names seem to be echoes of somewhere here, but then they're connected to Constantine, so it's a bit incorrect, but we can put pre-Rome as well. Pre-Roman British heroes or figures or something like that. So what seems to be going on here? What, how can we summarize this rather complicated piece of political propaganda? I mean, these politicians today are rather more straightforward, and you get what they're saying. If the medieval, early medieval politicians had to go to this much trouble, and then we had to sit down and read these things, it's, uh, uh, we wouldn't really understand what message they have. But so what seems to be, what might we suggest is the purpose of this scheme and therefore these genealogies? Uh, yes, I mean, he was king, he ruled from about the early 950s until he died in 988, and he ruled... Can you hear me? Uh, he ruled in... Um, in the southern part of Wales, okay? But his, and his father had w ruled there, but had also claimed to be, uh, had extended his power elsewhere. But the family originated from up here, okay, and they'd spread their power. This is what Burchin will tell us about uh, on um, uh, uh, Tuesday next week. 
So he's got a, a legitimacy problem. Go back to the last hour. I said one of the things they've got they're concerned with is how they can be legitimate. Because he's from a northern family, and through his mother, he's got power in the south. Okay, and his father had been a really big guy, so it was reasonable enough he gets power there as well. But they've more or less taken over that kingdom. And if nothing else, he's trying to legitimize and explain why he's that. But they seem to be doing more than that. I think they've got, he's got, or his father perhaps before him, had got kind of plans beyond just David. Okay, because this kind of claim, uh, which might make us laugh, uh, clearly um, was a significant claim. To be claiming that you are the legitimate heir of the Roman rulers, okay, ones especially connected to Britain. These are Roman guys who were active in Britain in one way, but also became emperor. To be claimed maybe to be descended from some of the pre-Roman rulers, to extend your cousins and powers over other um, Welsh kingdoms to es establish your connection with the northern British kingdoms that were disappearing but you are the kind of legitimate successor of those ancient kingdoms and then even just to make sure just as a sort of a good backup let's stick Jesus Christ in there as well okay and then everything's hunky-dory so it's a big claim it's a massive claim for someone who's ruling a reasonably small area so I suspect it's not just a simple one of saying I'm explaining how I've got power here through my mother and so on but it's also um, suggesting political aspirations political hopes that might go well beyond uh, their immediate concerns so we are uh, kind of like the English Alfred is now ruling Alfred's successors uh, will be ru are ruling uh, a significant uh, part of Britain and we are claiming to have a similar hegemony, uh, a similar power over Wales in that sense. Okay, Because we are the heirs of the Roman rulers, the pre-Roman rulers, we're connected to the northern British rulers as well and so on. I don't think it was just a case of seeing that so we can connect everyone up for a nice pattern. I think there was definitely a scheme in mind in this and there's almost, not quite, but there's almost a kind of symmetry in the way that I've presented it, okay, in the two sides and we go back and then divide up there and things like that. There's a certain symmetry in the way things work, which uh, I think is important too. So, theoretically an important source of telling us who were kings, who were rulers, who was the son or daughter of whom, but we have to be very careful with these sources. They don't seem to say very much, but they say quite a lot, perhaps in a way that we don't expect. Okay? And we've seen some of the sequences of names, the ones that rhyme, the ones that alliterate, they just seem too artificial. People didn't give these stupid names, father to son and so on. They look as if they've been added in there at some point to kind of flesh things out and so on. Oh, we've run out of names, let's make a few silly names and put them in and things like that. So uh, using these sources are very difficult. It's a very difficult uh, document to use. Uh, and the problem being uh, partly the political side, but also the fact that things are not preserved so well. Huh. Right. Anyone want to study early medieval genealogy? I did, my PhD. I did my PhD on these things, that's why I'm going on about it, so you might have had enough from that. Let's just very, very quickly, we've got 15 minutes, let me just finish off 5 or 10 minutes, uh, just saying a little bit about what's going on in Ireland. We've got Scotland to deal with, Wales next time, um, but we can say a few things uh, now, here. Uh, da -da -da -da. So can anyone kind of remind us what was our main, what were the main summary of the nature of political formation in pre-Viking Ireland? What was the main levels and characteristics? Can anyone throw their minds back a couple of weeks and summarize what I said then? I'm not after names, there's a more general. Yeah. Um, 
theoretically, who was at the top, but probably wasn't? Can you remember? Who, who in later tradition, was alleged to be at the top of the mound, but we're suggesting that was not... Your witch king, rather than kingdom, I should say. We can do it a hierarchy. Who was in the... There was the ki someone who would claim the, the high kingship, or who to be claimed to be called King of Tara. Does anyone remember that? I mentioned it briefly at the end. Tara here in Meath was in the kingdom of the southern Enel O'Neills, okay? But the southern O'Neills and their northern cousins kind of alternated as alleged kings of Tara or alleged high kings of Ireland, but they never asserted their power in such a big way, okay? So ignoring the high kingship for the moment, then we said Ireland was divided up into a series of over kingdoms, of which there was a, uh, usually one big guy uh, who had power, and he came from one of a number of families. Most importantly, by this period, the, the O'Neills in these two groups, okay? The remains of the old Ulster kingdom here. We have the Argyla here, but they were connected to the O'Neills. Connaught, Munster, and Leinster here, okay? Now, each of these over kingdoms was controlled usually by more than one dynasty or family, okay? Sometimes the families were related, sometimes the groups were not, but they kind of alternated in power. So the king of Munster uh, might come from uh, the Ogunacht Cashel, and then when he died, it might be the Ogunacht uh, Rathlin who had the next king of Munster, and it carried on like that. Similarly, amongst the Enel, we see the uh, shifting of power between the uh, uh, we called them the Shilnai the Sline and the Clan Colmar, okay, two families that alternated. They each had their own little kingdom, then they took it in turns almost to be kings of the southern O'Neills and so on. And it's similar in all the others. They had a number of big dynasties, two or maybe three, usually two, who kind of took it in turns to be king of the province. Then those guys themselves were king of their own little kingdom, but quite powerful, and then below them were smaller kingdoms below that. Okay, so we have this hierarchy going down. Now what seems to happen during the Viking and kind of post-Viking period is that in some of these regions, one dynasty tends to take over and get more power. So this alternating pattern in some cases breaks down. Okay, so one dynasty gets more power. So in the southern Enel, in the Midlands there, the clan Colmine become predominant. Okay, they become the main uh, dynasty. And the Shilna, the Slan, uh, cease to have as much power. And I mentioned before, in Ulster, it's the, even earlier I think, the Dal Fiatach had more or less asserted their power as provincial kings and so on. So that's one pattern we get. This alternating pattern that historians have tried to identify in some cases tends to break down and we see one family becoming more dominant. So again, political consolidation rather than fragmentation. We get focusing power in a fewer hands. In Munster, we have very significantly, a new group that comes into power. Later on, they get the name Dal Kash, which is what we've got here. But originally, they were one of a number of peoples called Deshi, which means something like slave or something like that, tributary people. So they were probably very unimportant uh, in terms of the traditional hierarchy, but they become more powerful through military ways, and then they establish themselves firstly here, and then eventually they take over the kingship of Munster. Okay? This is the one big case of a complete outsider, and probably originally a very small group, removing the Yogunath uh, ultimately um, from power for a while at least, and becoming the main kings of Munster. And the guy 
uh, that Fatty mentioned, as I said before. Brian Baru was is the most famous of the Irish kings. He was killed in the Battle of Clontarf, which was a battle between many Irish and the Vikings and so on. And he was presented as a kind of Irish hero fighting against the Scandinavians. But in fact, he worked with Scandinavians and fought against Irish. And he was just asserting himself. But he becomes, he claims to be high king. And in fact, effectively, for a while, he dominates southern Ireland. And a member of the clan Colman says, I am the main ruler in the north. So again, this old division of the um, provinces seems to break down. And we get the emergence of bigger, and more powerful guys asserting their power and so on. So not quite as clear as in England. We don't have the creation of the Kingdom of Ireland and something like we've seen with the gradual creation of England. But we do see uh, the uh, process of consolidating certain families and certain kingdoms and the assertion of power going on. And whereas we wouldn't say Brian Baru was king of Ireland, if he was high king, he did certainly exert a great power over other people, okay, as overlord over other rulers. He was the, the most powerful guy for a short while uh, in Ireland at the time and so on. So again, changing the way that politics was done and so on. The same kind of pattern that we've seen. Okay, any questions? It's late, we all want to go home. Okay, next time, I shall send an email out, hopefully tomorrow, I need to remember. Next time we will have Burchin giving her presentation about Wales again, but in addition, I want to have your uh, essay proposal and provisional bibliography of sources that you're hoping to look at. Okay? We'll go through everyone, have a little look at what you want to talk about, and then uh, I'll take them away and give you some more comments the following week. Well, bring them to the class. Okay? That's the main thing. Okay, thank you very much.